Hello everyone, in this video I will be introducing you to the idea of a galvanic cell as well as describing the basic operation, the common features and the chemical processes that occur in a galvanic cell. So let's start with a new definition and this is the idea of a spontaneous reaction. Now in VCE, I guess you can identify or define spontaneous reaction as a reaction which occurs naturally without needing an external energy source. So if you mix two things together and you observe a reaction without needing to apply electricity, for example, then it is a spontaneous reaction. This is a very simplistic view of what spontaneity actually is, but we don't have to go into all of the technical details in VCE. So I'm going to go back to this um, reaction that everyone likes, which is the reaction between hydrochloric acid and magnesium. And I think this is a really big piece of magnesium. So you can tell that it is a spontaneous reaction. It is also a very fast reaction. As you drop the piece of magnesium into the hydrochloric acid, you can see the reaction happening straight away. And I'm sure you all have seen this because we all did the reaction um, in class, but the this reaction, not only is it spontaneous, it also releases a lot of heat because the test tube will get really warm as the reaction progresses. So the second idea that I want to introduce to you is if you have a spontaneous reaction that is a redox reaction, and remember that this is a redox reaction, um, a spontaneous redox reaction would release energy into the surrounding. So it is exothermic really. And if the two reactants are in direct contact with each other, this energy is going to be released in the form of heat. So this particular demonstration is a spontaneous redox reaction, and you do have the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid in direct contact with each other. Therefore, the reaction is going to release energy in the form of heat. And you may ask yourself, how can you not have the reactants in direct contact with each other? And we're going to talk about that in a bit. I do want to give you another example of a spontaneous redox reaction, though, and is the reaction between copper sulfate and zinc. So here I have a beaker containing copper sulfate solution, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with copper sulfate and its color because you all have grown the copper sulfate crystals. And in this copper sulfate solution, I have added a piece of zinc. Now, this reaction is also spontaneous, so if you just do this, something will happen over time. However, it is a little bit slower than the magnesium hydrochloric acid reaction, so you're not going to see the result immediately. But if you wait for long enough, and you probably have to wait like a day, you may see this happening. So first thing to note is you have black solids that has covered the surface of the copper, sorry, the zinc strip, the the part that is in contact with the solution. And this black stuff is actually copper being produced. So one of the products of the reaction is actually copper solid. And the other thing that I'm sure you can tell is that the solution has lightened in color. So the color is not as deep blue as in this form. So something's, something has happened here. Now, if we look at what actually happens on a microscopic level, a copper sulfate solution actually contains copper ions and sulfate ions fully dissociated from each other because it is soluble in water. And it is the copper ions that it is responsible for the blue color of the solution. So the more copper ions that you have, the, the more blue it is going to be. So if I have a solution of copper sulfate, it may look something like this. Obviously, there is water present as well, but I'm, I'm not going to illustrate the water because it just makes things look really crazy. But you're going to have copper ions and sulfate ions fully dissociate from each other. And in the solution here, I have um, a zinc strip. And I've tried to illustrate the zinc as being a solid in this case, and it's going to exist as a metallic lattice. So what actually happens is the zinc and the copper sulfate are in direct contact with each other. And really, it is the copper ions and the zinc that will undergo a redox reaction here. So the zinc will donate two electrons to any copper ions that it comes into contact with. So you can have zinc go, going to zinc 2 plus because it has lost two electrons or has undergone oxidation. 
and the copper ions after it has undergone reduction or gained two electrons it's going to turn into solid copper so you can see the reaction happening again and it is actually very important that the zinc and the copper ions are in direct contact with each other otherwise electrons can't be transferred from one substance to another it is actually not possible for electrons to swim so the electrons like these two electrons cannot go all the way to here or all the way to that copper ions it can only be donated to the copper ions next to it so we're going to have this process again so you can see this is why you see the solid um, part surrounding the, the zinc strip because the copper has been produced near it and the solution also becomes lighter in color because copper ions is what is responsible for the blue color so if you have less copper ions um, it's not going to be as blue and the zinc ions that is produced actually going to go into the solution so you are effectively dissolving the piece of zinc but you probably cover it with copper so it's, it might be a bit hard to see that it has been dissolved all right, so why is it that we want to talk about direct contact spontaneous reaction? Now, let's go back to this for a second. Remember that this is a spontaneous redox reaction. So this is spontaneous redox. There is a flow of electrons. And as I have mentioned from the start, if you have a spontaneous redox reaction, it is going to release energy. Now, if I mix some zinc in a solution of copper sulfate, because the two reactants are also in direct contact with each other, the energy is also going to be released as heat. So as this process ha is happening, so if you go back to this diagram, one thing that is not illustrated here is probably that heat is released. So some heat is going to be released from this process. It's not going to release as much heat as the magnesium hydrochloric acid uh, combination, but it will release some heat. So you should be able to detect a change in temperature over time. So release energy as heat. So heat is not a very useful form of kinetic energy, if you compare to other forms of kinetic energy anyway. Um, the idea of a galvanic cell is you want to take a spontaneous redox reaction which involves a transfer of electrons and which releases energy. And you want to see whether you can set it up in a way that it's going to release energy in the form of electricity rather than in the form of heat. And the key to be able to do that is you need to make sure that you separate the two reactants. So I want to show you what that, what that looks like. So if you want to build a galvanic cell, which is just the fancy name for a battery, the first thing that you need to do is you need to separate the two reactants. So I have two separate beakers here. I'm going to put the copper ions in one of them and the zinc in the other. So that's my starting point. The two reactants are separated from each other. Now I'm going to add some other features and I will explain what they do. So the reason why you need to separate the two reactants from each other is because you want to create a path so that the electrons, the two electrons that are supposed to go from the zinc to the copper ions, instead of being transferred directly, the two electrons have to go through a path. And that path is normally just a wire. So by designing the, the reaction in a way that the two electrons have to travel through a wire, you have effectively created a flow of electrons through a wire which is just another name for electricity. So we deliberately separate the two reactants so that we can harvest the flow of electrons from the reducing agent to the oxidizing agent. That would have occurred regardless of whether the, the two reactants are near each other or not. Now, the other thing, though, is because electrons cannot just parachute into the solution, you need to create a path for the electrons. So in this particular case, this wire is being connected to a strip of copper. So there is a strip of zinc on this side, on the right side, and a strip of copper on the left side. And I'm going to put a solution of zinc sulfate on this beaker as well. So you basically are looking at two solutions, and there are two strips of metals, copper on one side and zinc on the other side. And the two strips of metal are being connected together by a wire, which 
most of the time it's also copper. So let's think about the reaction now. I actually don't know what's happening here. Okay, don't worry about the bit in the middle. I explain what it does in a second. So the two electrons that the zinc wants to donate, it will still try to donate. So two electrons will exit the zinc and go into the wire. So let's just focus on the right side. Two electrons will exit the zinc and go into the wire. And that's going to turn zinc into zinc ions. So that is what's happening on the right side of this diagram. Now, if you go back on the left side, so at the same time that two electrons are being donated from the zinc to the wire, two electrons will go from the wire through the copper into the copper ions. So the two electrons that are being donated from one side would not be the same two electrons that get received from the other side, but um, the amount of electrons that are donated and received will be the same. So on this side, you have two electrons going from the wire into the copper solutions, and it's going to turn the copper ion into copper. All right, so two electrons is entering the wire in this, this, this way. Let me try that one more time. Two electrons is entering the wire, and spontaneously at the same time, two electrons are being received not spontaneous, simultaneously, two electrons are being received on the left side. And because if two electrons are coming out of here, and then two electrons are coming into here, you basically have created a flow of electrons from the zinc to the copper. And that flow of electron is your, your electrical energy or your electricity. So in a battery, basically what you do is you put a device in the middle of this, so the electrons have to go through the entire device and then power the device before it can go to the other side. Um, okay, so you can have a light, like a light bulb or, or a fan or any device that you can think of, your laptop. And that is essentially how a battery is built. Now, there is a bit in the middle here, and this is what is called a salt bridge. Now, it looks really weird, but basically what it is, is you get a piece of paper um, or filter paper is what we tend to use. You can you can use other things as well. But you, what you want to do is you want to soak it in a solution, an ionic solution. And then you put it um, within the two beakers. So it's connecting this solution on the left and this solution on the right. And because it is soaked with an ionic um, solution, so normally we go with a potassium nitrate, you're going to see that within the piece of paper, you have cations and anions, as is being illustrated here. All right, so why do we actually need this piece of paper in the middle? Because if you look at the right side, which is the zinc, I have just turned zinc into zinc ions. So zinc has been turned into zinc ions. Now, if zinc has turned into zinc ions, I have just made this solution a lot more positive or two plus more positive than normal. So this at the moment has two plus more in terms of charge. So it has become more positive. Now at the same time on the copper side, I have just turned copper ions into copper. So I have, I have just removed a two plus ion from the solution. So this solution has just become more negative or less positive, if you will, because you have just used a positively charged ion. So if you want your cell to operate, you cannot have this imbalance of charge in the two solutions. Because if you think about it this way, if the zinc solution is just getting more and more positive as more electrons by being donated, it is no longer one to um, it's no net electrons because if the solution is positive, it's going to want the electron to stay with it because opposites attract in chemistry. And at the same time, if the solution on the copper side is getting less and less positive, it's going to become a lot harder for electrons to be attracted to that solution. So the key here is you need to take care of this imbalance of charge in the solution if you want the cell to continue, if you want to get another flow of electrons. This is where this device comes in, and it is called a salt bridge. So the copper side is becoming less positive because it has just lost a two plus iron. 
So the cations in the salt bridge, it's going to go to this solution. So it's just lost 2 plus, remember? So it's going to gain 2 plus. I think, I don't know why I have 4 actually. And then on this side, the anion is going to go so that it neutralizes the extra cations that has just been produced. So the salt bridge in the middle is going to solve the problem of the two solutions not having um, a neutral charge so that you can have another. So two electrons from here can then continue to go into the wire and two more electrons from the wire can then go through the copper and being um, received by another copper ions and then the process can continue. So eventually you're going to run out of the ions in this piece of paper and you have to re, um, re soak it with, uh, with more ions. Um, all right, I think I'm gonna draw um, what I just basically demonstrated again. So remember that we have two beakers. You're going to have, you're gonna have to draw a lot of this eventually. So two beakers, that's really terrible looking, but I'm gonna live with it. And one of them has a piece of copper and the other, I think I need some more room here. So one has a piece of copper and the other has a piece of zinc. So all you need to do is make sure that you annotate everything that you draw. So there is a zinc on one side and there is copper on another side. Now the copper piece is submerged in a solution of copper sulfate. So there is copper sulfate here and the zinc is submerged in a solution of zinc sulfate. Okay, the copper and the zinc has to be connected to each other through a wire. So this is a wire and the two solutions are connected via a piece of paper called a salt bridge that contains um, a solution of potassium nitrate soaked in the piece of paper. Okay, let's talk about the flow of electrons again. So the electrons will go from the zinc. So let's say we have zinc here and two electrons is going to go into here. So the reaction that actually happens is that zinc will lose two electrons and turn into zinc ions. So you get that. So the two electrons enter the wire and the flow of electrons is going to be this way. And the electrons is going to, well, at the same time, really, two electrons will go through the copper. This is why you need a surface here. So the electrons can actually go from the wire into the solution. And it is going to be donated around here. So it's going to be donated by a copper ion. I mean accepted, not donated. It's going to be accepted by a copper ion and that is going to produce solid copper. So on one side, the zinc strip is being dissolved slowly into zinc ions, whereas on the other side, the copper strip is slowly gaining mass because more copper is being produced and to, to stick to it. So at the same time, because this side is consuming positively charged ions, it's going to need some positively charged ions to compensate for that loss. So the, the positively charged ions from the salt bridge is going to go into this solution and the negatively charged ions is going to go into the zinc solution to neutralize the excess cations that just been produced. So you have flow of electrons and the flow of electrons also called the external circuit. X, which I can't actually pronounce up spell external circuit which is the flow of electrons and you also have the flow of ions through the salt bridge and this is called the internal circuit so this is the flow of ions so it is a very simple design but it's so effective simply by um, separating the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent from each other, you would be able to harvest that flow of electrons and use it as electrical energy. So electrical energy will be released from this spontaneous redox reaction rather than um, heat, which is not as useful. All right, so pretty much what I just said. So this 
cells, a device that uses a spontaneous reaction, and I talk about the separation of the oxidizing and reducing agent. This is a nice diagram, but it is unfortunately in the opposite direction of how I made my animation. Clearly did not plan that very well. <clears throat> and the separation of the oxidizing and reducing agent allows electrons to flow through the wire, and it, that, that flow of electrons is going to allow you to use electricity to power devices. Okay, so let's go into the specific features of a galvanic cell, um, because everything actually has names. So the first two features that you might have seen and heard of, you might have heard of this word, which is the word electrode. So the two solids that you see submerged in the two solutions, in the two beakers, those two solids are called electrodes. Now the definition of an electrode is just a solid that can conduct electricity. So it will act as the side of reduction or oxidation. So in this case, the zinc is acting as the side of uh, oxidation because electrons are being lost in this surface. And the copper is acting as the side of reduction because electrons are being gained through this surface. Now, this is also quite unusual because the zinc also is the reactant here, but it doesn't have to be. So the copper clearly is not a reactant. The copper is a product. It just serves as a side for the reaction to take place. Now, there are two re um, electrodes depending on what um, equal, half reaction is happening. The, ox the, re the electrode that has oxidation is called the anode. So an ox anode is for oxidation and the cathode is the site of reduction, or red cat. I think you remember red cat. That's enough. You can work out that the other one must be the other reaction. So the site of oxidation is called the anode. So in this particular example, the zinc is going to be the anode because it is where oxidation occurs, which is a loss of electrons. And the copper is going to be the cathode, which is the site of um, reduction because that's where electrons are gained. Now, the other thing to point out is that the anode is going to be negative in a galvanic cell simply because um, this pore essentially is experiencing electrons coming into it. So the anode is negative in a galvanic cell and this pore is going to be positive because electrons are disappearing from it. So you have a positive cathode and a negative anode in a galvanic cell and these are the positive and negative terminals that you should have seen in a, an, any regular battery. So the positive part is going to be the cathode of the battery and the negative part is the anode of the battery. Oh, I found this the other day. So kata is in cathode or another word that has cat in it is going to be cations and I think they, they, in this particular instance, are both positive, but actually means now, now what? I don't actually know why this is the root for this. Is it because it's losing electrons? Is it now in electrons? Maybe. And you know, the cathode is actually the bit that's poking up in a, in a battery as well. Or whereas anode or ana, so anode and then anion. So it's actually quite easy to remember that the anode's negative because anode, anion, cathode, cations. It's not always negative, and low, so we'll talk about that next year. So ana actually means up and upwards. Does that mean it has more electrons? Anyway, I just thought that those are quite interesting root words. All right, second feature is the electrolyte. So your, your electrolyte, let's your electrolyte here. Um, an electrolyte is essentially a liquid that can conduct electricity by allowing for movements of iron. So when you're dehydrated, you would drink an electrolyte, so it contains some ions, and that is going to create a situation where water will be released, and so you're no longer dehydrated. Anyway, I won't go into why you drink an electrolyte. Now, an electrolyte is often a salt solution, but it can also be a molten liquid. So in extreme situations, we do use a molten liquid to be the electrolyte. And especially when you get to gear 12, there are so many di different designs for um, a battery, so you can have some other materials to serve as the electrolyte as well. So the lithium ion battery, for example, has a matrix as uh, an electrolyte. I'll show you the design next year. So you can already see that there are two electrolytes in this cell, or three actually. You have the copper sulfate solution, the zinc sulfate solution, and 
the potassium nitrate, which is in the salt bridge in the middle between the two beakers. So there are three electrolytes in the cell that we just saw. Now, if you have an electrode and an electrolyte together, that will make a half cell. A half cell, which as the name suggests, is half of a cell, contains an electrode in contact with an electrolyte. So electrode will conduct um, electricity and provides as the site of oxidation or re reduction. Now, the other key point of a half cell is that the species present in each half cell must form a conjugate redox pair. Okay, so let's say, for example, I have an elect short electrolyte combination from the example that I just used. So you have a piece of copper and you have a solution of copper sulfate. So this is a half cell. It's made of an electrode, which is the copper, and an electrolyte, which is the copper sulfate. So that's only one of the two requirements. The other requirement is that this half cell must form a conjugate redox pair, which means that you must have an oxidizing agent and its conjugate reducing agent. And I think you do have that because you have the copper ion and copper. So the copper ion is the oxidizing agent here. Because the copper ions can potentially gain two electrons to form copper. So the, the oxidizing ion agent is copper ions and its conjugate reducing agent is copper. So you do have a conjugate redox pair. You have an electrode and an electrolyte. This is a half cell. Now the, the, the other side of the cell is also a proper half cell because you have zinc and you have um, zinc ions in an electrolyte with sulfate. So you have zinc sulfate here and this is zinc. All right, so again, we do have our conjugate redox pair. The zinc ion is going to be the oxidizing agent, and zinc is going to be its conjugate reducing agent. All right, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about different types of half cells. There are actually three types. This is the first one, which I already drew. So this is called metal ion, metal half cell, and this is in reference to the nature of the conjugate redox pair. So this redox pair contains a metal ion and a metal. Now, if one of the two species in the conjugate redox pair is a metal, then that metal can also serve as the electrode. As demonstrated here, the zinc is in the conjugate pair and is also an electrode. So if this cell is being used, it's going to directly affect the electrode. So the electrode will either be dissolved or reduce in mass as the zinc um, is being oxidized or if you have another situation when the zinc more zinc is produced um, the electrode is going to gain mass so you actually see changes in the electrode over time the second type of half cell is metal ion metal ion so both species in the conjugate pair in this case are ions so an example here is the ferrous ferris uh, half cell, so Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus half cell. Now, if you have two metal ions, and obviously none of them can act as the electrode because the electrode, by definition, has to be a solid. So when you have a situation like this, you're going to need to use an inert electrode. So inert just means it doesn't react. So you need to have another surface that can conduct electricity that will not... Um, interfere with the reaction. Graphite, which is essentially carbon, is a commonly used um, inert electrode because it is very cheap and it can conduct electricity fairly well. Um, but if you're really fancy, you can use some metals that don't really react at all. So that's the second type. Now, this is the third type, which is non-metal, non-metal iron half cell. So this is when none of the substances um, present in the conjugate pair is actually metallic related. So this is the example, which is Cl2 and Cl-. And the reason why this is its own category, even though it is very similar to the previous one in the sense that it doesn't have a solid, it is its own category it's because if you have a non-metal, um, elemental form of a non-metal tends to be a gas. So Cl2 is a gas, chlorine gas used in World War One. It's a chemical weapon. And then you have chloride ion. So if one of the 
substances in the conjugate pair is a gas, you need to redesign your cell in a way so that the gas can come in. So you tend to have this inverted tube. I think I actually have a design here. So it's an inverted tube that allows you to supply a stream of chlorine gas. And then you have the chloride solution in here. And you are using an inert electrode again. Now this one is um, platinum, which is uh, better at conducting electricity, but is more expensive. So three types of half cells, metal, metal iron, well, metal iron, metal, metal iron, metal iron, and non-metal, non-metal iron. All right, what else? So the last thing is a saw bridge. Once you have built two half cells um, successfully, all you need to do is connect the two electrodes with a wire, obviously, if you want to power, use the electricity to power something, you need to connect it through the device as well. And then you need a saw bridge. Now, the saw bridge is also an electrolyte and allow it allows cations to go to the, the cathode and anions to go to the anode. And it completes the internal circuit. Okay, now if you have to build your actual galvanic cell, it may look something like this. You can also connect your electrodes to a voltmeter and you can um, measure the voltage that is produced by the cell. So this is the um, animation again, simulation. I don't know what this is. I just want to show you everything again. So you have zinc, which will donate two electrons to the wire. At the same time, two electrons will exit the wire and go to copper ions. So the zinc turns into zinc ions and the copper ions go into copper. So in this particular case, the anode, which is the zinc, it's going to reduce in mass over time, whereas the cathode, which is the copper, is going to gain mass. So this, just to make the things easy to remember, electrons will go to the cathode. The cathode is positive, remember? Electrons will go to cathode, always. Electrons move towards the cathode. This is a truth that will never change. And you're going to need this if you continue with chemistry in the future. The cathode is the copper here, which is the side that gains um, electrons. And the anode is the zinc, which is the side that loses electrons. Also, cations, it's going to move towards the cathode. So again, very easy to remember. Everything goes towards the cathode, really. The electrons go towards the cathode and the cations go towards the cathode. I think it'd be concerning if the cations don't go to the cathode. It's like the same K, C-A-T. And the anions move towards the anode. You need to understand the movement and also to be able to label the movement correctly. So electrons go towards the cathode, cations go towards the cathode. And when all else fail, just remember red cat, cations, no, red cat's not cation. Reduction at the cathode is red cat. I think I just did something. So cation, I have to draw write a red, draw a red cat, but anyway, red cat, cation. Reduction at cathode, I need to stop saying cations. Is that the end of this video? I have two more examples. Um, the first one, draw a fully annotated diagram of a galvanic cell that can be built from a reaction represented by the following equation. So you're given a chemical equation, it is a spontaneous redox reaction. And the question is, if I want to build a galvanic cell from it, what would the galvanic cell look like? All right, so the first thing you probably want to do is to identify, is to make your half cells. Make the half cells. Remember that the half cell contains a conjugate redox pair, an electrode and an electrolyte. So I'm going to start by identifying my conjugate pair from the equation. So I think this one's very obvious. The nickel is turning into nickel 2 plus, so that's my first conjugate pair. Nickel 2 plus nickel. This is the oxidizing agent, this is the, the conjugate reducing agent. And Pb2 plus, Pb will be my second conjugate pair. Now, this is looking very good because I have solid nickel and solid lead, and they bought metal, so they can conduct electricity, so they can act as the electrodes as well. So my half cell, my first half cell, oh, look at that. My first half cell is going to be, I don't think that was any better. It's going to be a piece of nickel, and that's going to act as my electrode as well. So this is the nickel, solid, always put stents, submerge in a solution of nickel. Now, it's up to you what the solution is. You just need to make sure you pick something that is soluble. So go with like a snack anion. So let's go with nitrate, which is always, um, always good. So nickel nitrate. 
and my other half cell is going to contain PB. So PB is going to act as the electrode here. And let's use lead nitrate again because I am an original. So PBNO3, 2. So you have your two half cells. So that's step one. Step two is to connect the half cell. <laughs> now there are two connections that need to happen. You need to connect the two half cells the two electrodes using a wire and you need to connect the two solutions using um, a salt bridge. Now the salt bridge, the standard go-to salt bridge solution is potassium nitrate because I can be certain that it's not going to interfere with my reaction. So just remember to use potassium nitrate as a salt bridge at all times. And then you have to annotate. Yeah, so let's annotate. Now the common annotation would be cathode anode, flow of electrons, and flow of ions. So I can't actually spell annotate. So in order to determine which one is going to be the cathode, which one's going to be the anode, you need to look at the equation again. And I think it's quite clear to see that the nickel is losing two electrons to become nickel ions, and the lead is gaining two electrons. Well, the lead ion is gaining two electrons to become lead. So electro um, electrons mu must go from nickel to Pb2+. plus. So electrons must go this way, which means that the Pb is the cathode. So the, the Pb doesn't actually react. It just uh, provides a surface for the electron to go from here into the solution to be to go into uh, come into contact with Pb2 plus ions, which means that the nickel must be the anode. Okay, and so electrons flow to the cathode, cations also flow to the cathode, so K plus is going to go this way, and the nitrate ions from the salt bridge will go to the anode. So that's your standard um, annotation. You probably want to put the polarity of each electrode as well. The cathode is positive, and the anode is negative. Okay, let's do one more example of this. Um, so first thing to do, again, I give you the half equations. Sorry, the overall equation. The first thing to do is to determine your uh, half cells. So the first conjugate pair is going to be Cl2 and Cl minus. And this one is already a little bit more interesting because you have a gas and, well, the first conjugate pair, you have a gas and you have an aqueous solution. So the first pair doesn't have any solid that can serve as the electrode. So I, I am going to need to use an inert electrode and I also need to draw an inverted tube has been uh, named in past years as Pingu. So this is going to be my uh, half cell for the chlorine solution. So the chlorine gas is going to go into the, the inverted tube. This is my electrode, which is, let's go, be fancy and use uh, platinum. It's, it is inert, so it won't, it won't actually react. And the solution chloride ions. You can use sodium chloride. I normally advise not to use another metal if you can help it. So hydrochloric acid is actually the commonly used electrolyte in this case because it does have ions. All right, the second pair is Fe3+, Fe2+. So once again, we have an issue here because both substances in the conjugate pair are actually ions. So I need another um, inert electrode for the second one. You can use platinum again, but I'm going to use carbon for this one because I can. I mean, you, it doesn't matter. Just make sure it's inert. Like, don't don't go with Fe, actually. You can't go with Fe. It's going to react with the Fe3+. plus. It's going to be bad. Um, so because both species in the conjugate pair um, are ions, you can just label both of them in a solution. Once again, because I'm very unoriginal, I'm just going to go with nitrate. So you have iron 2 nitrate, and at the same time, you also have iron 3 nitrate. So that should be 3 here. So those are my half cells. The second thing I'm going to do is to connect things. So I'm going to connect the two electrodes using a wire, and I'm going to connect the two electrolytes using a salt bridge, potassium nitrate. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate. So once again, you need to look at the equation. If you're not sure which one has gained electrons, which one has lost electrons, you can find the oxidation numbers. So 0, positive 2, negative 1, positive 3. 
Okay, so chlorine has gone from zero to negative one, which means that it has gained electrons to become more negative. So electrons must go from the iron side to the chlorine side. And at the same time, the cations is going to go here as well. I don't think I have any, any room here. So K plus go to this side and the nitrate is going to go to this side. So interestingly, the cathode in this case is actually PT because it is the electrode. It definitely does not participate in the reaction whatsoever, but it is still the electrode. And the anode is um, carbon. Again, inert, but very essential anyway. So that's the cathode and that's the anode. Uh, I want to show you what an actual battery looks like, even though we won't talk about this in, in year 11, but don't do this at home. But you actually can see, so in a regular battery, the zinc casing is actually the anode. So the case is the anode and the rod in the middle is the cathode. So remember the cathode is positive, which is why the, the part that pokes up is always the positive part. And then there's like a bit here that's the negative part. Now, if you have a button cell, which normally has some silver in it, it, it also looks quite similar. So the negative electrode is going to be on one side and then the positive electrode is going to be on the other side. So you definitely have to have um, separation of the two reactants so that the electrons, so basically the electrons are going to go from the negative all the way to the positive. And if you think about a battery in a device, basically the electrons are going to power the entire device before it make it back. Oh, I made this diagram so you can have a look as well. So the two electrons go from the zinc and it enters the wire. And at the same time, two electrons will go from the wire into through the carbon rod cathode and get accepted by, it's actually a combination of reactants in the pest inside the cell. And then eventually you're going to dissolve your zinc casing, which is why when a battery is, is out, um, it's a bit wet because the, the, the pests in the batteries start to seep out. Anyway, that's all for now. That's just a preview of next year when it comes to um, battery designs.